even a grizzly can look appealing. But in those early days, they and the many packs of wolves were seen only as dangerous. Predators, including wolverines and the many mountain lions, were thought then to spoil the enjoyment of the scenery. But today, these hunters are the pride of the park. So why is it that these animals are all here again? And this land once more, as it was when the glaciers of the Ice Age finished cutting this jewel of the Rockies. Wildlife recognizes no political barriers. And the Rocky Mountains also straddle the international border, the 49th parallel. Some animals find Alberta in Canada and the mountains of Montana equally inviting. America's Glacier Park meets Canada's Waterton Lakes Park. And in a unique gesture of each country's friendship, together they form the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. The border showing only as a track through the forest. An elk may wander freely across or even down the length of the border. Two legs under Canadian management and two under American. The authorities are autonomous each side of the border, but consult closely because the park is a living system with no natural divisions. It was across this bunch grass prairie that an 18th century explorer first saw these shining mountains the 10,000-foot heights of Glacier's Rockies. Stacked one upon the other, ancient seabeds climb to the sky. Their sandstone, shale and limestone laid bare and shaped by the huge glaciers of the Ice Ages. Ice once filled this valley, clawing rock from the walls as it slowly moved, leaving knife-edged ridges and pinnacles to the winds and the eagles. Some 50 glaciers are still in the Golden Eagle's eye view, but they are diminutive compared with the giants that sculpted mountains such as this Triple Divide, the only such watershed on this continent. Snow melt and rain from here ultimately reaches three oceans, the Arctic through Hudson Bay, the Pacific via the Columbia River, and the Atlantic through the Gulf of Mexico. Glacier's white water adds to the flow of the Missouri and the Mississippi. Though still the most pristine of regions in America, the mountains did yield to the railroad engineer. A long-lost Indian pass was rediscovered, and with the agility of mountain goats, which became the symbol of the company, the Great Northern Railway planted its tracks across Glacier in 1891, in an age of change. The buffalo herds once filled the prairies, meat for railwomen and skins in profusion for hunters and Native American Indians alike. By the early 1880s, the herds were gone from the plains, and their natural predators retreated to find other prey in the glacier country. Once Glacier National Park was designated in 1910, and an extraordinarily spectacular road built across the mountains, it was well on the public map. But it was the scenery that people came for. The bears, no more than a dangerous sideshow. The park was seen as a rather uncontrolled zoo. In those early days, the killing of bears was even a routine park management task. The official policy was an odd mixture of public safety measures, long-standing prejudice against any predatory animal, and the acceptance of the trade in pelts. At that time, there seemed a total ignorance of how wolves, foxes, mountain lions, bobcats and bears fitted into the natural life of this magnificent wilderness. The worth of this land, it was said, lay in recreation, and the hiking and the fishing and the setting were outstanding. Fishermen, though, traditionally hope for something bigger and better every day. That's why, in 1916, a type of sockeye salmon was introduced to Flathead Lake near the park. The Kakani salmon, 
never migrate to the sea. They feed on water fleas in the landlocked lake and three or four years later spawn in the gravel of streams feeding the lake, such as McDonald Creek within the park. They displaced a native trout, but were considered better sport and an acceptable introduction to a national park. Bald eagles like them as well. For decades, on their annual migration south, they stopped over to fish at McDonald Creek, just as they are here, outside the park. But at McDonald Creek, the salmon were so plentiful, the eagles went there in hundreds, far more than a fishing here. It became a wildlife spectacle, and people came in thousands to watch them, until, in just two years, the fish population crashed. The eagles and magansas found more than sufficient, and the fishermen at Flathead Lake usually caught 100,000 a year. But only 6,000 were taken in 1987, and in 1989, they caught none. The large concentrations of eagles have gone. An introduced shrimp is thought to be a culprit. A possum shrimp are known to make kakani bigger and better. But in Flathead Lake, they ate the water fleas, the food of the kakani, and by day sank out of reach of the hungry salmon. The kakani starved to death, and sometimes were beached as water levels changed to suit a hydroelectric scheme, a fisherman's tale with a cautionary twist. But this international park is vast, 2,000 square miles, and most of it undisturbed. 250 lakes are fed by innumerable streams from the 50 glaciers, and a thousand waterfalls nourish rivers following a score of secret valleys. Still safe as yet from human tampering, many animals follow the life for which they were designed, cautious only of those enemies with whom they have evolved, ready to exploit the waters or the land over which they have their own dominion. Playful otters are never off guard. They can be uninvited guests in these waters. Black bears often swim in the lakes and rivers. It's early autumn and they're just taking a break from eating berries. The water takes his 200 pounds weight off his feet for a moment and the river weed seems worth a nibble. Also blonde or cinnamon brown, the black bears are the smaller of the two species here. The larger is the grizzly. It can be twice the size of the black bear, but only half as big as its relatives in Alaska that can tip the scales at a thousand pounds.
There's a deft skill at using the large claws to lift a stone or two during the concentrated search for insects, roots and berries. About 200 grizzlies roam the park and great care is now taken to see that they get no handouts from visitors or find scraps in garbage cans at campsites. Feeding only on natural foods, the grizzly is unlikely to associate people with an easy meal and be drawn into the kind of tragic encounter that has earned it a bad reputation through little fault of its own. Nose and ears are telling him there's something alive in there. It's probably a ground squirrel playing David to this Goliath. But even with its powerful muscles and fearsome claws, the bear is likely to give up. Ground squirrels have deep burrows to retreat into. The landscape is enriched by the presence of the bears, giants among the mountains, whose protection they seek in the late autumn by climbing to their winter denning places. To the heights of the continental divide, winter comes earlier than to the plains. At high altitude, the snows are already lying. It's an Arctic world above the clouds. On a ledge that was once the floor of an ancient sea, a grizzly wanders to its winter home. There are also bobcats up here, just below the tree line, above which the bare rocks and the snow fields begin. In the undergrowth here, there are ground squirrels, wood rats, and birds to be caught. Why bears select particular den sites is still something of a mystery. The bobcat is naturally curious about the bear, but its own food is rather smaller. But a cat can always look. And the grizzly is unlikely to have its nap disturbed. Not far off, these bighorn sheep are by no means settling down for winter. They have mating on their minds. He's not really interested. The bighorns are more vulnerable to mountain lions and wolves as they move down the mountain. It's the arrival of another bear that has disturbed the grizzly's rest. Both bears are aware of the ritual in the distance as three jealous males compete for a ewe. Sure-footed, she tries to escape on a ledge, but to no avail. Soon, all must move down to graze their winter range. On the very highest ridges of the Continental Divide live several hundred Rocky Mountain goats. Scarcely distinguishable from the snow patches that cling to this backbone of the national park, these are perhaps the pioneer animals of the glacier country. It's been suggested they may have lived through the ice ages on these rock islands far above the giant glaciers. the males scenting and licking females to find those in season. The shortening hours of daylight bring both sexes into breeding condition. 
He's cautious in his approach to the nanny. She could harm him with those nine-inch dagger-like horns. A goat has been known to kill a grizzly with such modest weaponry. These animals are also intent on mating. An ability to fight ruthlessly can be essential up here, not only against the agile mountain lion, but other mountain goats, because here the resources of grass and space are limited. Even these hardy alpine dwellers will shortly move off the ridges out of the teeth of the winter snowstorms. On these slopes, the grizzlies are very busy digging in. Three bears are making a den on this slope, a mother and two well-grown cubs. Bears sometimes den alone and sometimes in pairs or groups. Getting the den comfortable is sometimes achieved by using bear grass, a kind of lily common on these mountains. A female may already be pregnant from her mating the previous summer. Under the winter snow, her new baby will be born in the den. Winter settles early on the high ridges and, as always, will be reluctant to leave them. But now, fierce winter storms blow down the valleys and the prairies vanish under snow. Survival through a glacier winter demands stamina and resourcefulness of an animal. The mule deer will soon shed their antlers in February, a meal for mice under the snow. But the same midwinter's snow hides the valley's grasses from the deer, so they need this second line of supply. Hanging over their heads is an evergreen larder. There will always be a few that don't survive, but their bodies freeze in the forest cold store. The wolverine is about the size of a small black bear, but is actually related to weasels, otters, and skunks. It's a strong, fearless, and cunning animal, and can produce an offensive odor. 
No animal hunts adult wolverines. But its fur was valued by the Inuit people because frost and frozen breath can be brushed off the smooth hairs. No predator is hunted in the park anymore, but wolverines are still rare. And the wolverine is one hunter that wanders over a large area in search of winter kill. The return of the timber wolf to Glacier's Valleys is one of the most remarkable success stories of modern national park policy. But the wolves came here quite naturally, moving south from British Columbia using the corridor formed by Waterton Lakes Park in Canada, adjoining Glacier's mountain wilderness. There had been no wolves in Glacier Park for 50 years, since they were shot or trapped in hundreds when the park was opened for visitors. But in 1986, a single pack came here, selected a den, and raised the first litter of pups in half a century. Now, some 30 wolves, including naturally dark-furred individuals, hunt the plentiful white-tailed deer and elk. Their presence is still controversial and they are now the subject of a special wolf recovery study. Arguably, the most misunderstood, persecuted and slaughtered animals of the continent. The wolf has reclaimed its home. Once, they howled from the Arctic to Mexico, but they were silenced over all but a hundredth of that range. Here, they have themselves made a remarkable new beginning. The alpine winter may linger until June, but as the lower valleys ease earlier towards spring, the risk of avalanches increases. Glacier Park loosens its bonds of ice. Out from its solitary den, a grizzly is ready for a New Year breakfast. And from another den, there comes new life. Mother may only have half a dozen or so cubs in a lifetime, and she'll take good care of this one over these first dangerous weeks. Predator may take predator. And to the mountain lion, the tiny furry bundle must look like an easy meal. But while mother stays close, bear cub is off the menu. And there's no real shortage of easier prey for these lithe cats.
A mountain lion or cougar family will be more easily satisfied tracking deer or elk herds. Or even a solitary moose. Though here they may be in competition with a larger hunter. Among the 200 or so grizzlies in Glacier, this is one of the biggest. At around 600 pounds, he's on the way to rivaling his huge Alaskan cousins. He's more than a match for a moose and already has a carcass hidden under the trees and bushes. When he's eaten his fill or fancies a vegetarian diet for a while, he may cover this meat with soil and branches and keep the remaining ribs as spares for later. fed bear presents no threat anymore. There's morning action on the bunch grass prairie. Male sharp-tailed grouse are lecking each defending its territory against other males and intending to mate with whichever drab female decides he's best at this morning sundance. The sun is higher in the sky. He's fed well and just relaxes a while. It probably feels good to be liberated from the den, and the snow melt is uncovering all the plants and shrubs that please that investigative nose. Death throes of winter still stress the fresh growth awakening to the sun. Pask flowers defy the snow. And so do ground squirrels suddenly awake from hibernation, 
thrust back into the world come snow or shine and obliged to find food as well as they can. And there's danger approaching. A coyote senses movement under the snow. Perhaps not that hungry, and may have already dined on deer or elk. Its passing is noted without missing a leaf. At alpine altitude, young goats are born well before the snows have gone. But it's mild enough for the goats to moult their hair without being too cool. They are less shaggy than the stands of bear grass, the lily on which the bears bed down. They are in full bloom. Some plants may be 30 years old and blossom only once in seven years. Spring has come to the park. In the spring and autumn, the mountain goats climb down to this rock face, scoured out by the Flathead River. It's steep and dangerous, a trial even for their specially shaped hooves that allow them to go where only birds would seem welcome. The rock is attractive also to cliff swallows. They have come to collect mud for their nests but the goats are here to eat it. They relish the salty and sulfurous taste of this mixture of minerals. It's essential to their diet and not available on the crags or in the plants they graze. For the new kids, it's a real test of young hoof work. The adults try to keep the novices safe, but some do fall, to the advantage of ravens. <laughs> An older juvenile is curious about the fallen kid. But the precarious lives of these mountain experts are always at risk, and many are naturally selected from the herd. he survived his first visit. That rock really must taste good to bring them back again and again. The community of animals hiding in the bunch grass of the prairie plays a deadly game of hide and seek. Badgers versus ground squirrels pits a ferocious digger against a team of keen sighted lookouts shouting warnings to other ground squirrels in their burrows. A 
A false move by a ground squirrel provides a meal for the badger's family. Ground squirrels have the misfortune to be relied on as food by a number of prairie hunters. The red fox has cubs to feed as well. And badgers are not without a taste for fox cubs. Mother sees one of the cubs getting over curious about the badger. Her colouring shows she's a cross fox, a colour phase of her kind, just as the silver fox further north is also a red fox, but in a different coat. The rescue seems a little clumsy. But the badger's mind is obviously elsewhere, so mother can relax. And the cubs get on with the games fox cubs play. Summer has arrived. To this wildest place in North America, one and a half million sightseers and adventure seekers arrive each year. They come to see both the scenery and some of the wildlife. And this ground squirrel rates them less dangerous than a badger. Here are the new fruits of the original idea, a national park with Western grandeur outranking the old world. The customers keeping to the distant trail may miss the marmot or, while admiring the forest, may fail to spot the great grey owl and its family. But this is not a zoo without bars. Those owls would never tolerate a million voyeurs eavesdropping all summer. Just to know they are here and share their surroundings, perhaps even to hear them or catch a glimpse at dusk, is enough for most people. And that respect for the wild is a key to its survival. Riders are welcome to the park, but where people and horses go, change is left in their tracks. The riders admire the view, while the horses are scattering alien seeds in their manure. Knapweed are plants out of place, toxic to adjacent native plants, unwanted beautiful invaders. The dandelion doesn't swamp the prairie with its colors, but follows the roadside. Black bears have taken to them, but that brings bears dangerously close to people. Park rangers know people love to see bears, but that visitors too easily forget these are wild animals. Everyone is now discouraged from feeding them. In the past, that has led bears and people into fatal conflict. Through bears seeking food that is carelessly left in tents, a fed bear is a dead bear, they say, because the animal usually ends up having to be shot.
With care, encounters like this can be safe and full of wonder by being so close. But there is danger when she's a mother with a hidden cub. She may feel she has to defend it. The bears no longer have any real reason to fear us. And this is their hunting ground anyway. Even the hard bits with yellow lines on. Most of these mountain ranges can be said to be bear country, even what might seem to be the most unlikely places. Grizzlies are by no means designed like mountain goats, and yet in summer, some are up here among the golden eagles. What brings them to the mountain can be discovered by watching the activities of a bird, Clark's nutcracker. The answer is a moth or rather thousands of moths tucked in among the loose rock scree near the tops of the 10,000 foot peaks. The grizzlies have known about them for generations. They must have turned over tons of rock on the few high mountains that provide them with this unusual feast. Handling the rock even wears their claws down. That's a good deal of work for a mouthful of moth, but there's no doubt the bears like them. Occasionally, they go down for some berries, but then climb back. It's really easy meat, and it's mainly mothers and cubs that exploit this strange resource. The moths are several kinds of army cutworm. They fly here in June and stay until September, when they fly down to the plains, mate, and lay eggs in the soil. The larvae are a pest of grain crops. They cut at the parts of plants under the soil, hence the name cutworm. It's only the adult moths the grizzlies love. But not all bears have a taste for moths, and it is a scientific puzzle why only some bears make this annual climb while others stick to a more traditional diet. Wild and natural as it is, the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park is not without problems. A major concern is the disappearance of the white bark pines. These striking trees have been badly attacked over the last 80 years by mountain pine beetles, by a fungus, a blister rust introduced accidentally from Europe at the time the park was designated, and by heavy growth of dwarf mistletoe, a parasite of white bark pines. 
The beetles in the mistletoe may have been encouraged by the efficient prevention of natural fires in the park. Clark's nutcrackers harvest most of the large, nutritious seeds in the cones. These birds are the principal agents of dispersal and so responsible for most regeneration of the pines. The blister rust kills the top limbs, so no cones can be produced. The damage opens up the tree to beetle attack. Not until a pine is a hundred years old will it bear many cones anyway. In the cold, high places they favor, white bark pines grow slowly. So the old stands are dying, and young ones, if they survive and can compete with other kinds of pine, are slow to replace a once rich wildlife resource. Red squirrels have always liked the seeds of pines. Their skills are cutting the cones and caching them in the ground as a winter store. As the white bark pines die, they are having to turn to lodge pole pine or limber pine instead. It's a cooperative operation. The squirrel's labors will also be appreciated by other traditional members of the pine community. The bears. They'll dig up the squirrel's hordes in autumn. The partnership of many animals and the white bark pines have been forged mainly by the tree's huge production of nutritious seed, more than any other comparable pine forest. Complete loss of the white bark pines would be a catastrophe. Aspen gold showers down on the autumn breeze. The season's crop of berries lures mule deer to feed. Many have antlers in velvet, though some are already unsheathing their new rutting headdress by lashing the bushes to dislodge the irritating soft skin. For 10,000 years, since these valleys came free of ice, the deer, elk and moose have responded to their autumn desire. Just one last picture before winter's snow again excludes us from this contact with the wild. But such a picture may well prove to be the very last. Superior weaponry deserves respect. In a national park, an elk or a ground squirrel should feel free of us. Our world sits on the edge of theirs, the boundaries unrecognized by the animals. Their homes are fast becoming our homes. The riches of the land around the park the timber, coal, oil and industry are needed to fuel our way of life. That is excluding animals and plants as ruthlessly as the predators of glacier country were killed a century ago. Yet this wilderness is needed. Thousands of people champion its presence by vowing to come back year after year. And not just for the scenery. To the crown of this continent, 
the full complement of predators has returned. They are the living epitaph to the hundreds of bears, mountain lions, bobcats and coyotes, and the thousands of wolves slaughtered within living memory. But will our new knowledge of their lives allow us the courage to live alongside them? A feast of roots and berries sets these bears on course for the long winter. Waterton Glacier National Peace Park is closing down for the cold siege. It becomes a forbidding place that may well have protected itself from us by its very wildness. As numerous as the ants that mate in the autumn is the diversity of life scattered over this land. By its health and continued existence, our own future may be measured. Mm -hmm.